Um, okay, so welcome everyone. Again, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are logging from. And um, I am very pleased today to be here to welcome our um, AG Leventis Fellow at SOAS Center of African Studies. Uh, my name is Angelica Basquiera, and I'm the manager of the Center of African Studies at SOAS, and I manage the AG Leventis uh, Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. And, and today we are very uh, pleased to welcome here um, our fellow, uh, Dr. Olua Bunmi Tope Bernard, who is coming from the University of Bafemi Awolowo University in Nigeria. Um, and um, Dr. Bernard uh, today will present um, a, a, a paper based on the research, uh, and the title of the presentation um, is. Um, it is neither a rat nor a bird, taboos and eco-resilience in Yoruba sacred orature. Um, a brilliant title, uh, very um, engaging. And um, the, the sort of, uh, I, I won't go into too much detail because we already waste enough time here. And uh, I, am, I, will, I will pass on to, uh, to Dr. Bernard, but just in a few words to say that um, she's looking at um, eco-justice and environmental issues. Uh, but the perspective she's using is very interesting because she's using an ethnographic lens um, uh, for the study to examine how strict taboos are used as a tool for environmental sustainability in Yoruba sacred orature. Uh, so um, it's, it, it's so this, this respect is much to contribute to a co-claim of Yoruba vision of eco-justice. Um, so very interesting, and um, you know we are very very pleased to welcome Dr. Berna here. Uh, I will just say a few words about our discussion. Uh, we are very pleased and very grateful uh, to Professor George Olusola Agibade, who is here with us uh, uh, today. Uh, also from the University of Bafemi Awolowo University, um, and um, he is um, uh, he is going to be the discussion um, after um, Dr. Bernard's presentation. So the format is: I will now pass on to Dr. Bernard to give a talk. Uh, she has PowerPoints. Um, and she will give a presentation. And then uh, we, um, we're going to have uh, Dr. Uh, Agibade coming in to make some point of uh, comments and discussion. Uh, and then uh, because we have a very large audience, we really want to hear uh, from the audience questions and comments. And uh, the audience, please put your questions in the Q&A chat, uh, in the Q&A box. And we will pick um, as many questions as we can within the time uh, that we have available. Now, without further ado, uh, uh, I am passing on to uh, Dr. Uh, Ola Oluwabunmi uh, Tope Bernard. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Angelica. Um, I want to share my screen. Thank you very much for that very kind um, introduction. So hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you wherever you're joining this seminar from. My name is Oluwa Bonedonad, and I want to thank you for coming. I want to start by thanking the AG Leventis Fellowship through the Center of African Studies for giving me the opportunity to be here at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, as a visiting scholar. This fellowship has given me the opportunity to access relevant materials at SOAS, in UCL, and the British Libraries. I also want to thank again, Ms. Angelica Basquera for facilitating my stay at SOAS and this seminar. And to my baby, Ayomiku, happy birthday, baby. <laughs> Mommy loves you so much. So the title of my presentation is, it is neither a rat nor a bird, taboos and eco resilience in Yoruba sacred literature. Let me share an experience with you that would help build the context of this research. I have lived in the staff quarters of Obafemi Awolo University since 2018. The university campus has a well-preserved ecosystem filled with rare trees, exotic plants, birds, and animals. The house I lived in at that time was the boys' quarter. The boys' quarter was built strategically to back the main building. There were no high wall fences between buildings, only trees and plants were used to mark boundaries of each compound. I was returning from office one day when I saw a black cat standing by the side of my house. 
not far from my plantation and banana orchard. In my compound, as I was pulling into the driveway, I marched my car brake to observe the cat who was looking directly at me. I froze in my car and almost started panicking. Why was I panicking at the cat at the sight of a cat? You may wonder. I panicked because churches, mosques, and Nollywood, Nigerian movie industry have always presented animals, birds, and insects such as cats, birds, and bats, bush rats, vultures, hounds, and even bees as bad women. We are made to believe that when you see any of these animals, someone in the village or colleague at work is trying to get you. Simply put, they are witches. The numerous testimonies of people whose problem disappeared after killing one of these animals are celebrated in churches and mosques with Thanksgiving. Even social media is not a safe place. There are videos flaming cats or owls were transformed into human while returning from COVID meetings after they had been struck by daylight. Even though we've never seen any of this transformation in these videos, we believe them to be so true. So that was why my first reaction to a black cat in my driveway was that of a fear. My engine, my car engine must have been running for a while because I, before I remembered, it was just a cat. My maternal and paternal grandmothers owned a few and they never attacked me while I spent my school breaks with them. I drove in and parked my car took my bags into the house and came around the house to see the cat clearly, but it had left. I stared into the plantation and banana um, orchard to see if I could see the cat, but I did not. So I concluded it had slipped back through the bushes to where it came from. I didn't think much of it about the cat until I saw it again the next day while I was parking my car at the same place. I took my bags inside the house and brought water in the bowl to where the cat was. The cat ran away as I was approaching with the bowl of water but I left the water there anyway. When I came back to check later, when I came to check back later, the, car, the water was gone. So I assumed the cat came back and drank it. I decided to start refilling the bowl with water whether or not the cat was there. This went on for about a week before I saw the cat again. This time, it did not run away when I came towards it. I'm assuming it's a tomcat. By the end of the third week, meeting the cat waiting for me in my driveway had become a and during the same week, I was able to actually get close after fail, several failed attempts. Then one night after that, I was woken by a loud scream coming from the house opposite mine in the middle of the night. I was shocked, but I did not pay it any mind until I started hearing people praying. I had a shrilling meow, but I went back to sleep because I had a long day. I had a long day and I was going back to work the next day. So on my way out, my neighbor chatted me up and was surprised that I slept through the whole rancor during the night. I confessed that I heard the noise, but I was too sleepy to investigate it. She told me an evil cat that had been distressing her for weeks was finally caught by the Holy Ghost while it was locking in the night to perpetrate God knows what evil. She told me she was praying in the night when her spirit told her that God had granted her victory over her enemies. And at that point, she started hearing the cat meowing. She called the her pastor immediately and he put her through Bible verses to read before killing the cause of her problems. She did not stop there. She went ahead and burnt the cat to make sure it stayed dead. When I asked her to describe the evil cat, my heart sunk because her description matched that of my tongue cat friend. I cannot say for sure if my cat friend, if my cat friend was what was the evil cat, but I can say that I never saw the cat again after that. Thousands of innocent animals and birds are being killed yearly because what people do not understand, they fear. And what they fear, they destroy. This brings me to the term mysticism, which is what most religions are based on. There is no religion that does not have an aspect of it shrouded in misery. Unfortunately for African traditional religion, colonialism and neocolonialism continue to demonize its misery while promoting that of other religions. Cats are associated with witches in Yoruba society, especially after the notion was popularized by Robert Egunde in the movie Jaya released in 1981. In the movie, it described cats as agents of death, destruction, and darkness. Why, Yoruba, why the Yoruba dread and kill cats? We make cute interjections when we see cats presented as witches in Western movies, like Harry Potter, where Professor McGonigal, an aged woman, 
is a witch that shape shifts into a cat. And Hermione, one of the beloved characters in the series, is a witch who actually owns a cat named Crookshank. Why are we not scared of their cats or associations with cats, but we think Yoruba cats are evil? Why are we not scared of cats in Western fiction, but Yoruba fiction are one of the leading causes of cat deaths and adoption and no adoption possibilities? It is because of movies with titles like Ologo Meji, Olongo Yagdemi, Olongo Dudu, that has a shared cat with evil spirits. In SFA, if our divination points, which is a compendium of Yoruba word. Cats are associated with clarity, resilience, protection, and longevity. One SFR that associates cats with clarity says, When a cat climbs the roof of the house, it sees with greater clarity. Cats are nocturnal and therefore, their eyes are designed to clearly see in the, dark, in the darkest places. Like other members of the cat family, domestic cats can climb high, can climb easily to get a clearer view of their surroundings. And the higher they climb, the, clear, the clearer the view. Also, Yoruba believe that malevolent spirit attack targeted victims at night. So the piercing eyes of the cat can see them and protect the families from attacks. The cat's power and misery are in its eyes. So mysticism is generally featured in Yoruba culture and particularly its tradition, which is passed down orally for many generations. And according to Shoyenka, it is densely mythological. For anyone here who is not familiar with Yoruba, allow me to introduce Yoruba to you. They are a confederation of people with common heritage, numbering close to 50 million. They inhabit parts of Bene, Ghana, and Togo, but most of that population is domiciled in West, Southwest Nigeria the most densely populated country in West Africa. Aspects of the culture so that, such as oral, cult, oral tradition, political systems, legal systems, healthcare, and religion have been anti-fragile, which means they have been able to survive the pressure and stress that is associated with colonial, colonization and also benefit from it. Their beliefs and practices have had worldwide impact and are shaping religions in the diaspora, especially, particularly in Brazil and Cuba, from in form of Santeria and Orisha traditions. Traditional religion and its sacred origin are an intrinsic part of Yoruba culture and worldview, which gives an insight into why they relate to the environment the way they do. An important thing in Yoruba oral tradition is the connection between all living things, which is what informs the basis of the interconnectedness between Yoruba, Yoruba deities, and the environment. Yoruba oral tradition, oral tradition distills the excess, essence of human experience. Performance of these forms take ancient images and shape them into spoken texts that influence, that influence audience in contemporary society. As one of my mentors would say, if Yoruba culture was not anti-fragile, it would have been wiped out by colonialism and Western influence. It has strived against odds of Westernization its oral tradition being the repository of indigenous knowledge helps to understand the Yoruba reliance on, and on it in the effort to solve problems of environmental degradation. Eco-resilience or eco-anti-fragility. Anthropogenic destruction of flora and fauna is one of the biggest triggers of worldwide environmental degradation. The Destruction has led to flooding, desertification, incessant rainfall, forest fires due to a rise in temperature, extinction and near extinction of wildlife, and other, other harsh realities that come with environmental change. This, I mean, with climate change. These studies examine how street taboos by the Yoruba are tools for environmental sustainability. This perspective as much to contribute to the core claim of Yoruba vision of eco-justice that the imperative of economic development should not obscure a community's moral responsibility for conservation and sustainable environment. How an environment reacts to stress in, form of, in, form, in any form determines its resilience. Eco-resilience is a term used to describe the ability of an ecosystem to recover from human, human perturbations. The concept of ecology, 
Cool resilience was first introduced by Holland in 1973 to portray the, to, to portray the persistence of natural structures in the presence of environmental stresses due to natural or anthropogenic triggers. There, resilience is defined as the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing a change. So it's still, it's, it's, so it's still, it still retains essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedback. But it is not enough for a system to be able to, for a system to just bounce back after stress. How it holds up after stress is just as important. Will it become fragile, robust, or will it become, will it be improved by benefiting from the pressure? Antifragility characterizes something that does not break under stress or pressure, but actually benefits from and grows under pressure. American essayist and philosopher Nassim Nicholas Talib inverted this concept in 2012, posits that antifragility loves uncertainty and volatility that allows a system to grow and thrive. Antifragility goes beyond resilience or robustness. The concept which, was, which originated as a mathematical theory was given a, a humanities approach by Nini Boko in 2014, where he describes anti-fragility as not the opposite of fragile, but the capability of a system to withstand stress, disorder, uncertainty, and volatility, and also be able to benefit from that. A fragile system breaks under stress, disorder, or instability. Systems, however, are not anti-fragile all the way. Beyond a certain level of stress, they begin to hurt. It goes beyond resilience to anti-fragility. But how things do not break or spoil from an attack or event, but also gain from this adversity. Resilience endures or survives. The anti-fragility, anti-fragile endures, survives, and gains from that adversity. Ecosystem, me, ecosystems are being constantly threatened by anthropogenic and natural events. It is not enough that the environment, in some instance, is able to recover from it. It must also be able to benefit from these stressors. So eco, so anti, eco anti fragility is characterized by how the, the environment recovers from degradation and benefits from it. Yoruba's sacred orator, he knew how environment benefit from anti-fragility of the Yoruba traditional religious practices. In the Yoruba cosmology, there are numerous deities. Scholars of Yoruba traditional religion have numbered this deity to be over 1,700. This is mostly because some of these deities have different names in the thousands of Yoruba towns all over Southwest Nigeria. Still, one cannot dispute the presence of numerous deities in Yoruba pantheon, and that some of them are more popularly worshipped than others. Among these are Ifa, divination and wisdom deity, Oshun, fertility and river deity, Shongo, thunder and lightning deity, and Oya, strong wind and uh, river deity. Apart from the fact that Yoruba deities manifest as natural elements, the Yoruba also worship any natural element that is perceived as supernatural or that is believed to be occupied by a spirit, such as the mountains, hills, rivers, streams, and some specific trees. Each one of these natural elements and deities has an origin that is specifically attached to them. For Ifa, there is Esefa, Yerefa, and Ifa Kiki. Simply put, Ifa Dimination Poems. Oshu has Oshupepe. Oshu chants, Shongo has Shongo Pepe, Shongo chants, and Oya also has Oya Pepe, Oya chants. This oracle con contains thousands of verses in which everything pertaining to these deities can be found, also through which one can learn much about how they view the Yoruba, including myths and taboos. Myths about Yoruba, Deities are many, but in the end, there are those who argue that deities are people who lived on earth when they are created, when, they, when it was created, and from who present-day folks are descended. 
and those who argue that deities are people who are deified after departing from earth and are worshipped by followers who may or may not be conceived as descendants. These myths have no record of deities dying. The devotees claim the deities departed. These deities have massive contribution to how they are worshipped. How these departures have massive contributor have massively contributed to how they are worshipped and how this relates to environmental sustainability as presented in their origin. When Ifa departed, he ascended directly into the sky. Oshun became Odu Oshun. Shongo entered the earth, according to some myths, while Oya disappeared into thin hair, entered the earth, or, this, or became Odu Oya, according to some myths. The presentation of deities as elemental phenomenon is not limited to Yoruba myths. It's not limited to Yoruba myths. Other cultures such as Greek also present their deities in that matter. Greek deity, namely Zeus, Hera, Idonis, and Nestus are presented as fire, hair, water, and earth. According to pre-Socratic philosophers, particularly Empedocles, earth, hair, fire, and water which he referred to as classical elements have had great influence on, myth, on Greek mysticism, cosmology, and environment and religion, just as Ifa, Oshun, Shongo, and Oya in Yoruba religion. The interaction between earth, hair, sky, fire, and water are natural, even though they may never, they may sometimes be catastrophic, they are also needed in achieving a sustainable environment. And because these deities are part of nature, the Yoruba treat the nature and the environment as a living entity. It also underscores the belief of the Yoruba in the mutualistic relationship between physical world and the invisible world. These Yoruba deities are in the environment such as this, they see Yoruba deities in the environment such as in palm trees, where Ifa sacred knots are found, thunder and lightning, which presents Shongo in action, in strong winds, river, and wildlife, which represent Oshun and Oya. Growing up in a Yoruba community, I've heard stories about sacred forests that were pre well preserved for, the relig for religious purposes only. No one was allowed to go into this forest for farming, hunting, cutting of trees, or any form of action that is not linked to traditional religion or rituals. These forests were, were called Igbo, sacred groups. It was forbidden for an unauthorized person to enter into this forest, not to talk of hunting for animals or even cutting trees there. It would be regarded as an act of defilement. The consequences for of flouting that rule was far too there. Thus, the Yoruba saying, a child was cutting a tree in the sacred group when he was asked to identify himself. He said, I am the one who would never be able to do this again. Even the name of the culprit is deliberately made to be informative, to give anyone who hears it an idea how dare it is, how dare the consequences of desecrating, a grave, um, desecrating sacred groups are. The saying may also be used to warn anyone who intends to flout any taboo because they believe that any toba shion teniko shiri, ojure yori on teniko giri, whoever chooses to do what no one has done before will suffer its consequences. Saying that this help create necessary fear in members of communities to jointly preserve the forest and wildlife. A war in Yoruba is Yoruba word for taboo. A war means something that is not worldwide. It is something inspired by fear, the source of which is traced to beliefs in horrible disasters, which overtake those who inadvertently cross the forbidden line. For the sake of this research, I have categorized them into three, personal, religious, and communal taboos. Personal taboos are taboos that are meant for a single person. In the olden days, when children are born, Parents take them to Ifa place to know the baby's future, a practice which is still common to date when children are born into the family that worships Ifa. They call it Akosejaye, looking into the future. If Ifa divination is performed for a child and the priest will tell the parents what Ifa foretells about the child's future. 
there may also be warnings in there that manifest as a work, taboo for the child. If the child flouts any of this award, it may not be a, it may not, it may have an immediate or a future effect on him, which is one of the reasons for the saying, a child that insults the Roko tree should not expect an immediate retaliation. There are also awards that are common. <clears throat> this award can be for the, a whole lineage or an entire town. If an individual breaks this award, <clears throat> the person and everyone in the village or town face the consequences. Thus, the reason the Yoruba will say, if our neighbor hits bad insects and we did not warn him, this labored breathing would not allow us to have peaceful and restful night. Yoruba deities are manifested in natural objects such as landscape, meteorological phenomena, material substances, and some wild animals and birds. Therefore, some of them play strict rules on strict taboos on their devotees to ensure the continuous interconnectedness between the deities and the devotees, and by extension, the community. This is because an harmonious relationship between humans and deities will help facilitate a sustainable environment. Therefore, religious taboos are put in place to, in order to maintain an harmonious relationship between the three. <clears throat> the diagram above, the, this diagram depicts the circle of life as an important tool deployed by the Yoruba to promote sustainability. The concept of Orun, the invisible world, in the Yoruba cosmology state, the Yoruba believe that Orun is the abode of deities while Aye is where humans live. The relationship between these two worlds is mutualistic. You scratch my back and I will scratch yours. Just as, just like bees need pollens from flowers, and flowers need to be pollinated by bees, humans depend on deities for blessings to live a good life and deities benefit from the worship of humans. Deities give instruction that can aid in environmental sustainability to their adherents. Some of these instructions are presented in form of taboos. As I have noted earlier, these taboos can either can be both, I mean, can be personal, familiar, communal, and religious. At the same time, a person can combine all these taboos. What this means is if one is one not to eat again, the, person, the same person can be from the old lineage where it is taboo to kill or eat the weaver bird. And our family deity may also be Oya, which forbids her from eating the sheep. This ideal <clears throat> order of the society is guided by dangers which threaten transgressors. Personification is one of the ways through which natural world is presented with human traits in Yoruba origin. The technique is not used to assert childish understanding of non-human nature, but consciously to account for interrelationships, humans and otherwise. In Yoruba sacred origin, it gives humanness to nature and in so doing establish a living, establish it as a living entity, which makes it more difficult to flout the taboos that are put in place to preserve this life and non-life forms. It is their way of protecting, protecting wildlife rights, which even though not as efficient as it was in the past, is still pushing for environmental sustainability and preservation in the present world. If humans see animals as equal, they will extend the same level of respect to them along with, with them. Along with personification, there is also cremamorphism, which is comparing person, in this, or in this case, deities, to an object in some way. This literary technique is also common in Yoruba sacred literature where deities, especially those that were human before they departed, are presented as natural objects and animals. One of such animals is the Columbus monkey, which represents twins, spir twin spirits among the Yoruba. Children are important to the Yoruba because they represent the continuity of bloodlines and a chance at reincarnation. However, multiple birds, especially twins, are, more, are even more regarded because the figure two represents balance in Yoruba philosophy. To them, a twin is never truly dead. When a, a twin departs, a reibeji, a little wooden figure, is made and added to the family shrine. That act defies the twin. 
Twins are likened to the Columbus monkey, partly because they are cheeky and playful, and partly because hunters say they never find dead Columbus in the forest. That's according to Ogundele 2001. Because of this, of the deity status of twins and likeness to Columbus monkey, this is a taboo to arm the Columbus, to col the Columbus. As an IFA also, as an if SFA also places a strict taboo on killing the Columbus because he is an offspring of Oshun. Arebe dunile edu mosa adi afun edu edu tin show mo ya aya chuboni ojo kon edu asi aya wa jali oloko wa di edu lokun nigba ti won mu de ilede won ri pe omo Oshun ni won wa so fun oloko pe eni ti o mu wa yi awon awon o gbodo pa nitori omo Oshun ni when edu had run to when Edo had to run on the ground, he could not run very well. If our divination was performed for Edo, who is the same mother, who is of the same mother as Aya, but one day, Edo and Aya committed an act of theft on the farm. He, the farmer captured Edo and tied him up with a rope. Then when he took him to the quarters of Oboni, it was discovered that he was an offspring of Oshun. The farmer was told that the person you have brought to us we, they must not kill because he is an offspring of Oshun. It is very easy to see why Oshun is protective of Columbus monkey. She is a deity of fertility and new growth, and Columbus is tied to multiple birds in humans. Statistics, medical statistics show that Yoruba people have the highest rate of twinning in the world. To protect this, to protect the Columbus is to protect this phenomenon. Oshun River keeps the environment properly irrigated and lush and human encroachment in the reserved forest, which is the habitat of Columbus monkey, is the reason for the conflict reported in the SFR. If animal, humans respected ecological structures, there will be sustainability. Currently in Oshun Grove, in Oshun State, Nigeria, Columbus monkey are protected by this taboo and they roam freely. If our priests have confirmed that if our divination performed for clients, whether good or bad, is also always accompanied, accompanied by prescription of appropriate sacrifice. This idea is corroborated by Yoruba and Forism that Oonto Dara, Unfajo, Eitoku Diye Kato, no, Unfajo, a good thing, a good and not so good thing, require offering sacrifice. The acceptance of sacrifice by date is even more important than the offering. Yoruba believe that Ebo Ti Egumba Je Lodaladaju this sacri the sacrifice consumed by a vulture is the most acceptable by the deities. Evidence of that resonates in the SFR below. Sala gere jelo di fa fungu nugu omo lo do bolo boloro shaga shaga shala gere gere wa jebo igun wa jebo kebo le ba afi eti wa jebo kebo le ba da igun eti ara lo de. A sheba or ibu, aki yo shebo, aki yo le shebo. Translators, shala, shala gereje was the ifa priest that performed divination for the vulture, offspring of Ologbo, o loro, shaga, shala gereje. Come and eat sacrifice. Vulture, come and eat sacrifice. So that the sacrifice may be accepted by the gods. Etie. Come and eat sacrifice. So that the sacrifice may be taken away by the gods. Oshu, vulture, nicknamed Etie, offspring of Elode, one who does not realize, one does not always realize that vulture, without vulture, one cannot perform sacrifice. I have argued in the, I have argued the appearance of vulture and their connection to the promotion of environmental sustainability elsewhere. They are a, appear ancient, abode and have goodness. Since sacredness in terms of having more than one power is being clothed, having more power, and being closer to the ancestors as one grows older is recognized. This bird tends to revel in this symbolic connection. Aki Europe be Gulori Ato Kangere. Ni shawo ni kush kangere. Ni o shai darubo igunuguki kulewe. It is impossible to see a young vulture rummaging through death. He walks agadly. Even when it is old, vultures live to be incredibly old. They, 
Vultures feed, always feast on dead bodies and thus appear to defy death and remain unclean. They are both sacred and unclean at the same time, the coincidence of opposites. And in this consideration, <clears throat> excuse me, they fit into, they fit the road of Otto's definition of the holy. So their power is also, they also have power of sight and smell. They can smell when an animal is about to, is, is dead or killed. They even smell death before it occurs. They are known to follow animals or people about to die. This association with death and ability to smell death is considered very potent, a very potent sacred power, which is why it is a taboo for anyone to arm them. Iroko tree falls under the category of natural objects that are seen as extraordinary because of the belief that spirit possesses them. Spirit possession is what makes them sacred. The spirit that inhabits an Iroko tree is, called, is, uh, is argued to be called Uruere, Agadangba Oshumari. Adiafu Iroko Igbo, Nigba ti nje la ane ota, amu ota, nda Iroko Igbo la amu, Igba ti mwa de igi Iroko, eshu ni mwa ugbo da ge, nito ripe igi aba mimi. The giant rainbow performed divination for Iroko of the city of Igbo when he was living amidst enemies. Enemies were threatening Iroko of Igbo. They, when they got to the foot of Iroko, it should command them that they should spare it because it is, it is a special tree. In the essence, it should forbid the cutting of trees to avoid the danger that will result from the destruction of Uluwere's house. It should protection, protect, it should protecting, protection not, it should is protecting not just the environment, but also the interest of the community through this move. This solidifies my argument earlier about the mutualistic relationship between deities, humans, and humans for the promotion of sustainability in both seen and unseen worlds. So this study actually, this study is, um, he looms that there are resources within African tradition that contribute to environmental sustainability through, uh, sustainability through the mining of the wisdom in African tradition, we can understand the problems and procure, procure lasting solutions. Practices such as the imposition of taboos of, on killing or eating certain insects, reptiles, birds, mammals, and cutting of certain trees, and the consequences of flouting them are contained in the selected sacred origin, as contained in the selected sacred origin, can aid the survivor of the fauna within this ecological niche. Um, this is where I stop, and I, I want to really take a moment before I completely leave to thank to, for our acknowledgments. So I want to thank the AG Fellowship, AG Leventis Fellowship again for the opportunity to be here, and, for, and I want to thank so as the School of Orient and African Studies at University of London for giving me all this, for giving me access to all these uh, resources that I have. And to Miss Angelica Mascara, thank you for I mean, helping me with this, every, everything, everything. Your yeah, darling, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank my university in Nigeria, Obafina Olo University, and my department, <clears throat> Department of Linguistics and African Languages, for giving me the space to, I mean, to perform, to do my research and for giving me, approving my leave to come and do this fellowship here in London. Also, I want to thank the IFE Institute of Advanced Studies for introducing me to the uh, act of critical thinking and um, other methodologies. I'm grateful for, to the convener. And I want to take this moment to thank Stephen Arjuan. We were fellows at University of Michigan. He helped design this PowerPoint. I, I didn't do anything. I just put the words in. Thank you so much, Stephen. And also, fine, I want to thank um, my, my, um, my set from secondary school, everyone. Thank you so much for the support and they are here. And I want to thank my mom for taking the boys and giving me the space to actually concentrate on my research here. And this, these pictures are when I met Maury and uh, Emilia during the lunch that was supervised by Angelica. Thank you so much. And finally, again, I want to thank my son who made me a mother seven years ago on this day. Happy birthday. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh 
Thank you so much, Olua um, Bunmi. Uh, and, um, you know, it was a really, really interesting presentation. Thank you for all your thanks to all of us. And, um, you know, um, it's been really fantastic uh, to have you at SOAS. You brought so much um, uh, interesting and fresh ideas. And we, we, we've been really, really pleased uh, to have you here. And we only have a few. A uh, couple of weeks left before you actually return to Nigeria, uh, but we hope to stay in touch and to keep connecting through our uh, Leventis program. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I would uh, now like to bring uh, um, in uh, Professor George um, uh, Agibade, if I pronounce it correctly. And uh, yes, it would be great if uh, Professor, you could come in, make some comments. Uh, about the presentation before we open to the um, to the Q and A, there are quite a lot of questions in the Q and A and the chat, uh, so it will be good to, to be able to go over them. But for now, I will uh, we welcome uh, Professor Sola Agibade to come in and say a few words. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm glad to be here this evening once again. Uh, just as uh, people have been. Uh, passing comments. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bernard for this wonderful presentation. Uh, very lucid, uh, highly informative, and uh, culturally and literally uh, presented. Um, that very topic, uh, it is neither rare art or bird, taboos and echo resilience in Yoruba, sacred uh, origin. The presenter, has done a wonderful job by going through various segments of her presentation of her paper, beginning from various definitions uh, of sacred oriture and giving us some types, uh, talking about um, theoretical framework, theoretical framework and definition of various uh, keywords, even in the theory uh, that uh, she has used. And uh, she has. Uh, shown how we can use various taboos for environmental sustainability. That is using sacred origin of the Yoruba people um, as tools to talk about justice, eco-justice, environmental justice, um, and talking about the interplay between uh, so-called animals and human beings. I use the so-called because we are all animals anyway, uh, but it is believed that one animal is higher than the other. I mean, it's a kind of a general uh, view of the people. Um, yeah, the paper is well-structured, uh, sincerely well-structured and giving us information about the Yoruba people, their location, their figures, uh, their belief system. I'm talking about the Urisha tradition among the Yoruba people and making us to realize that this Urisha, that is the deities, uh, they are of different types and that it is from this very Urisha tradition that the tradition of the deities among the Yoruba people orchestrated the oral literature that we are using for them, either in their worship or as a kind of supplication uh, or what have we. Uh, when we are talking about Yoruba uh, deities. Yeah, yes, um, she has given us some examples of some animals uh, that Yoruba people, I want to use, I, I don't want to fall into error, that Yoruba people attach another meaning to their activities within their cosmography. Uh, so she has mentioned some animals uh, in the form of cats, in the forms of um, uh, bats, um, rats, and some other animals, chameleon, virtual, and even some, uh, I mean, how do I put it? Some uh, small creatures. I don't, they are not animals anyway. When we are talking about ants, uh, they are not really animals anyway. I'm talking about trees. The belief of Yoruba people about some trees, about some kinds of trees, 
and um, their relationship with some unseen spirit. And the relationship between these trees, the unseen spirit, and the animals within the cosmology and the cosmography. She has explained all these things very well. I want to use Swartz analysis that is talking about the strength of the paper. The paper is very, very lucid, like I said, informative, and uh, it's one that I'm sure that is going to promote both literary tradition and cultural, uh, cultural uh, tradition. The paper was well presented. However, in a minute or two, I want to make some suggestions um, that the presenter uh, might be able to take a look at the sacred oral literature that she has made use. To me, I think it's, she dwells so much on the Ifa literature, Ifa oral tradition. So there is nothing bad if she can uh, mention that one at the beginning of the paper to let us know that actually the major or secret oriture that she has used is uh, Ifa secret oriture. Um, then on the issue of referring to cats or animals as witches, uh, that might sound very uh, somehow. Maybe she can say, I mean, the presenter can look at it by saying that uh, the animals, the Yoruba believe that they are witches impersonated. It is not that those animals are really witches, but that they have the kind of spirit in them that we believe that, yes, it is a kind of a, a witchcraft that are manifesting in those kinds of animals like uh, cats. Um, yes, and there is another important aspect, though she mentioned it in the listings, as touching the role of cats and some other animals in the healing system of the Yoruba people. I want her to see that even though many people may believe that cats symbolizes the presence of witches, at the same time, she needs to let us know that cats occupies an enviable space when we are talking about indigenous healing system. It is very, very important. And they don't even see cats all in the negative sense. For example, when Yoruba people are talking, they will say in Yolongbo ki kanle, that the back of the cat will never touch the ground. It has many. It is talking about the power of cat as an animal. That is, naturally, it possesses some characteristics that the Yoruba people are employing in their indigenous healing system. So I just use that one as an example. It is very, very important. Yeah, it is neither rat nor bird. Uh, it is not a that uh, they talk about, they refer to as animals that uh, is neither a rat nor bird. It is a jow. A jow is different from a dun. A dun is bat. A jow, I, don't, I can't remember the, the English word right now, but they are two different animals. So you can make that correction uh, as well. Um, yeah, then lastly, sorry, there is the need for you to look at the interrelationship between phonology, that is the names of all these animals. Look at the Yoruba perception and belief system about all these animals and the way they deploy all these characteristics in their cosmology and cosmography for sustainable development. So that is where you can bring eco justice, why they should not tamper with certain animals just like that. And the idea of lineage or yeah, lineage of some people, their relationship with animals, whereby the issue of taboos come, come in. Because for example, in my own family now, in my own lineage, there are, animals that we can eat and there are animals that we cannot eat based on a kind of mythological narratives that has to do with the origin of my lineage. But that does not mean that another lineage must not eat the animals that are forbidden in my own lineage. All these things should be taken into cognizance and um, 
uh, I believe that all these things will enhance the beauty and the quality of this wonderful paper. Once again, I want to say congratulations for this well presented paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps, uh, Dr. Vera, do you want to respond before we open to Q&A? Well, I, I, I want to maybe appreciate um, Professor Adibade for taking his time to, um, to give me this um, insightful feedback because he, he, he was listening in as I was presenting. Like he doesn't have any formal or prior knowledge to this research apart from the title and the abstract. It's, it's um, like I'm. I want to yeah say that I appreciate everything you said, and this is um, I I some things you're saying I know, and I'm aware of, and the agile yes I also struggle to look for the English um, name, but I could not find it, so I'm like I'll just leave it be for now until I can actually maybe find an English name for that particular um not a bird or, or not an animal. It has um, if I connotation. Yes, I know I will sort that. And I also want to say that this is um, um it's a part of a broad more, I mean a broader research. So it's it's a um, chapter in the book. And so it's um a lot of things I can't actually put into the 45 minutes Angelica has graciously bestowed on me. So I had to, I mean, I had to for, I mean squeeze every, I thought what I would be able to give that would actually give an insight into my research was all I was able to squeeze into this um, very magnanimous time given to me by Angelica. So I will take note of the things you've said. I'm very grateful for everything. Thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor, um, for your comments. And um, and now uh, we um, we do have a, uh, there are a lot of comments in the chat. People are very grateful uh, to the presentation, and they're asking also if you could share the PowerPoints. Um, mm -hmm. A presentation is up to you, but but uh, uh, just so you know, this event is recorded and is going to be available on the SOAS YouTube channel uh, from next week. Uh, therefore, you can also go back on the. Um, on the event uh, in that way by going to the source YouTube and typing in the title of these talks and you will you will receive it. Um, so as I said, yes, there's a lot of thanks and the people have been very inspired by your presentation. Um, there are three main questions in the Q&A box and um, I will now take them one by one and, um, and, 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 and put, pass them to you, uh, Dr. Dr. Bernard. Uh, the first question comes from uh, uh, Professor Marie Last. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I did mention it at the beginning, but Professor Marie Last is actually the main uh, sort of, uh, we call it like the, the director of the program. He has been part of the Leventis um, Fellowship Program for many, many, many years. He's an expert on um, uh, uh, religion and sociology and, and anthropology in northern Nigeria in particular, but he has a, a great understanding of Nigeria as a whole and the region as a whole. Um, so Mari, uh, question is, given that the Prophet Muhammad much prefer cats to dogs, do the many Yoruba Muslims share this uh, demonization of cats? Dr. Bernard? Um, do you want me to answer each question or do you want to ask the questions and then I can, like in batches? Apology, I think we can go one by one. Okay. Uh, because there are no, there are three, so we can do one by one. Okay, I have seven okay. here, but okay. So I thank you, Professor Last. I will say that um, um, what most scholars would say that um, you are first and foremost a human before the culture always comes through. You are you are a real human in the culture, then the religion comes in. So because Yorubas are first and foremost um, Yoruba people before the advent of world religions like. Christianity and Islam, there is this um, Christianity and Islam, yes, there is still this art, art, part of it that's still cultural. So, like um, Professor um, Adibadi has noted, and like I said while I, when, while I was presenting, cats are not, it's, it's not that people actually are seeing any cat transforming into witches or something like that. It's just the notion that they are, the people just, I think it's, like I said, popularized by the movie industry that they are, in, they, they are possessed by witches. 
So they, it's assumed that witches actually transform into them or they are transformed into witches or something, but people just think that cats are evil by nature or whatever, not that they've actually done anything. So I cannot, I would say that Muslims, if they, their preference to any of these animals will be a personal thing. I don't think it may, it may necessarily not be religious. If a Muslim choose to own a cat, it may be because of his personal preference, not because it is somewhere in the Quran that he has to own a cat or that it must not have owned a cat. What I do know that is that they don't eat pigs because that is laid down in the Quran. They can't eat pigs, but I don't know if they have to or they do not have to actually own cats. I think that would be a personal reference, I mean, preference for a Muslim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernard. Uh, perhaps if uh, Mari has uh, other comments, uh, um, you can raise his hand and I can allow him to talk. Uh, Mari, you, if you want to let me know, you can raise your hand. Um, now, moving to the following question, which is also very interesting. Uh, Ade Olu Oyekan is asking, uh, first of all, he said, very interesting presentation. Congratulations. Um, he, he says, I would like um, I would like that you talk a bit more about witchcraft and animal representation in Yoruba orature. You have talked briefly about the cat and the olobo, a a generative, but what about the place of birds? Aj is also a very familiar folk team in Yoruba culture. Thank you, Amade Olu. Um, I was, yes, th those are very valid questions and points. There is a um, representation of birds as um, as um, witch, witches or as um, witch incarnated animal and animals. I will use animal now. It is yes, that's why we find in Yoruba culture. But I mean, witches are referred to as eleye birds because they are manifested as birds. And yes, they have. That's why I mentioned owl. I mentioned um, there is all oh, there is the owl, how. People all, I mean, I've always identified owl as a witch, as a witch possessed bird. So yeah, there is that place in Yoruba folktale and folklore that actually recognizes the place of birds in um in um or, or witchcraft represent animal representation in um as I'm sorry, that uh, uh, rep, that represents that puts birds as um spirit, I mean witch possessed. Um, life forms, I would say. So yes, they are. Like I said, there is so much that I could not put into this presentation. So that's why I actually, I mean, remove those parts of it. But there are, yes, present representations of them. Witchcraft presented as birth in Yoruba folklore. Yes, there are. So. Thank you. Perhaps, uh, Professor uh, Agibadi, you want to come in on this one, given your expertise in folklore? Yes, very much. Can, uh, um, actually, I, before you even called me, in, I had it on mind that even the main, you know, the main appellation for the witches is bird. A uh, cat is just by the side. It's just by the side. Whenever you are talking about witches, you are talking about birds. Whenever you are talking about birds, you are talking about witches. You know, that is the general knowledge of the Yoruba people. They, 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 that's the way they you know, referring to witches as birds in many sacred literatures, especially that of uh, Ifa. So uh, the person who has raised that question has uh, raised it well because uh, it's even good to make reference to witches to to use both to make reference to to the witches when we call somebody eleye in yoruba they are saying that the person is a witch is a witch so the person is correct that understanding is is perfect yeah. thank you thank you very you're much welcome. you're welcome um okay um yeah there are more questions now coming in i can see the audience is getting very excited uh so i'm going to the next question because there are actually quite a few now um the next question is from wazir wazir uh he's saying that he's uh, i'm interested in the idea surrounding igboro the question i have is was uh, was the protection of the sacred groove and and direct consequences of secret 
cultic practices or was it directly constructed to protect the environment? Well, thank you, um, Wazir. Wazir. Um, well, the idea of Igbo, you, um, like um, most um, world religion, they have places of worship. Okay, if you are going to, if you are a Christian, you're going to a church, it's a building. If you're a mosque, you're going to a mosque, it's a building. Um, yes, Yoruba, um, Yoruba traditional, tradition, and traditional religion has um, deities as well, and they have places of worship for this deity. So these Igbo are sacred, they are, they, are, they are set apart to actually, to be used for the worship of these deities. And well, as much as they, because like I said in my presentation, Yorubas believe that everything around them has life. It's living, it's alive. The earth, the ground is alive. The sky is alive. If the wind blows certain way, the Yorubas suspicion of it. Everything, they believe there is life in everything. So yes, and I've said that when the deities were going to depart, according to the myths, they became natural or um, natural elements. Okay, some of them became wind, fire. Some of them, when they were alive, they put fire and all that. These are the things that actually combine to form the way they are worshipped. And this, so when you feel that these deities are life forms around you, or, or yeah, in some myths became um, manifest as buffalo. Okay, in my town, in, I, I come from the Oluji in those states, and one of the Oluji is Oluji Ojefa. We don't eat buffalo. Well, if you can find one, but we don't. So how do they come about the fact that they, how do they come about that? It's because they, they when they, in the myth of the creation of the town, when they were lost in the bush, it was the buffalo that actually showed them the way out of it. So in, they are the, the myth of the town is in connection to Oya, who manifests as a buffalo. See, you find them in this rare forest, in this preserved forest. So if you are going into these kinds of forests to hunt, then you are hunting the deities. You are hunting the life forms that represent that these deities manifest as. That is why if you go into the river Oshun in Oshobo, in the Oshobo group, and you are hunting for you are fishing for fish, you are not fishing in the belief system of the Yoruba, you are actually fishing the children of Oshun. So in a way, these places are just preserved to make sure that. The and when you when yeah let me say when those places those kinds of places are actually preserved that way you find that most of this um the felling of trees the burning of bush don't get near so when you go to Oshun River it's very very easy for you to spot fish because people don't actually fish in there so they they they, they keep this um environment lush and very and flourishing that is the so it, in the beginning it may not necessarily be to preserve the environment, the, I mean, that may not necessarily be the, um, the reason why these forests are create, were, 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 put, um, were set apart. But it turns out that putting them apart and preserving the life forms in there has contributed to environmental sustainability. The Yorubas, the Yorubas that means the Yoruba can actually see into the future. They see the importance of preserving all life forms because everything that surrounds them has life and needs to be protected. So that is why they actually preserve Igbo. So it may not necessarily mean that they preserve it in the beginning so that they can have, um, they hope that in the future, they will be pushed for environmental sustainability. They do that because they do that to, ref, do, um, to reference or to revert, sorry, to revert the deities that they believe are actually life forms all around them. So I, that's why um, Igbo, I think, uh, I mean, from the things I've read are preserved, they are not like preserved, preserved just so they are preserved for preservation purposes, but because they are places of worship for deities and because everything in there is actually um, attached or linked to a particular deity. I hope I've been able to, yeah. mm -hmm. so I'm still doing a lot, but I hope I'm able to, yeah. Hey, Professor Gibadi, do you want to comment? Yeah, because I mean, yeah, I I think there is one part of the question from that person that she's missing. She needs to talk about how 
the UNESCO has waded into the preservation of secret groups among the Yoruba people in Africa, all over the world, but especially among the Yoruba people. She mentioned Oshon Groove. In fact, they have carved, they have uh, built a wall around the sacred groove of Oshon deity. Nobody can just go there now without taking permission. That is a form of modern preservation that has enhanced the perception of the people by demarcating that place as a sacred group. That is one. And then she said that they don't go to worship, uh, they don't really go to worship in sacred group. No, not all sacred groups. There are sacred groups that they go there to worship, they go there for empowerment. In fact, when you look at the meaning of Igbo Oru, that is the bush for ritual. This is that's a literal translation of that very uh, of those two words, Igbo Oru, bush or forest for rituals. Oro is rituals. For example, the Egogo, Egogo festival. Egogo, we go to Igbo Oru. They call it Igbo Igbale in Egogo court. That is where Egogo will start before moving into the communities. When the Ifa priest, whenever they want to wrap up the initiation rite, it is done in their Igbodu. They call, it, they, they call their own Igbodu. That is the sacred groove for Ifa worshipers. That is where they compartmentalize the issue of initiation of a young initiate into the Ifa court. So they do so many things. They use both sane and unsane powers to preserve those sacred groups in Yoruba land until today until today. So therefore the Yoruba have devised means to protect those sacred groups and uh, thank God for the modernization for civilization that has given the body like a UNESCO to take over some of these sacred groups and uh, protecting people from bastardizing and encroaching into, for example, that of Oshogo, somebody went into part of the, of the, of the group to build a house. They fought and fought and the UNESCO asked to wade into it and they won for the traditional worshipers. And that is why they were able to take over some part of the places that have been encroached. So this is a modern, that's why I said that we have physical and uh, non-physical means of protecting those secret groups today. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, now I'll move to some other question. Oh, you want to comment again? No, 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 I'm, I'm reading. <laughs> yes, uh, I was going to pick a question from Gozika Obiani, who is uh, oh. actually our uh, co-fellow of this year event. She, is, um, she came to see us um, last term and, um, and uh, she was supposed to come at the same time as um, Dr. Bernard, but then because of the situation, they were but it's sort of like ours. So I will actually uh, give it the chance to ask a question. It is very interesting. Uh, she's asking, are there good witches in Yoruba sacred orature? How is the rise of Pentecostalism in Yoruba land affecting the sacred animals, totems and the rest? This is bearing in mind the pre uh, preponderance of mega churches in Yoruba land. Very interesting question, Gozika. Thank you. Thank you, Gozika. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, let me start from, I will not start from the witches part, I'll start from the, um, uh, how Pentecostalism in Yoruba land is affecting sacred animals, totems and the rest. So part of this research is also spoke about, I was at, um, I, was, I, I was at the British Library a couple of weeks ago and I asked to go through their map section. What was I looking for? I wanted to see how, um, Lagos Ibadu Expressway, if they had an aerial view, is it? I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm speaking wrongly about maps, as in the aerial view is how you see the landscape, the landscape view of the, if they had, they, they are still going through the maps, they, 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 they are still looking for it. And what I wanted to do was to compare um, how Lagos Ibadu Expressway used to be before it became um, a space for mega churches in Nigeria. 
Okay, every mega church is in Nigeria. I mean, if you have, a, if you are a church in Nigeria or a mosque and you don't have a, an headquarters at Lagos, but yeah, you are expressway, you as my people will say, you are a learner. You are just asking, like you don't even know what is happening to you. At the same time, if you look, if you Google landscape at um on um and, and you focus on um Oshu 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 Groove Oshu Sacred Groove, you will see the difference between these two locations. Okay, Osho Grove remains green and lush, while Lagos Ibadan Expressway is all, all sorts of colors, roofs, buildings, and all that. That tells you that physically, you can even tell the difference between uh, how, how the um, Yoruba in, um, traditional religion influences the environment. It's, it, it is Yoruba, uh, Yoruba um, traditional religion is, is uh, created in a way that is actually embraced. It is, it is like it, it, it takes the environment, it takes itself into the environment and it takes the environment into itself. So it doesn't do it doesn't do much to de I mean to take from the environment, it puts back in. That is one of the things that actually we are looking at in other sections of the research. How is uh, um, Pentecostalism, I mean um, doing at what part is Pentecostalism doing in environmental degradation and all that? So just looking at the a map, the landscape map, you can actually see the difference between these landscapes. And then she asked about, um, and the witches, and with, I mean, the when I, when I, I in the beginning, like I said, um, about the cats. Yes, we, there are a lot of this um, fright for cats stem from all these, um, from, from Christians, from Muslims, the things they say, the amount of people that have transformed from cats into humans which I have never seen, and I don't know anyone who has actually seen any, have fueled the fear that people have for these pets, for these animals who we normally have as pets. When my, I mean, when I was younger and my grandparents were around, they were common. But as we keep growing, it's like they are reducing. People don't keep them as cats and as and pets anymore. And then talking about um, um, if there are white witches. No good. Good, okay, good, and um, bad witches. Well, um, Washington would say that um, to say um, a witch is good or is bad depends on how it affects you, okay? And I'll put that into perspective. So if I'm saying a prayer and I want my enemies to die, it is a good prayer to me. It is a bad prayer to my enemies, okay? So, and it's still the same prayer. It just depends on which side of the, I mean, the divide you are standing on. I'm the one saying the prayer, so it's good to me. It's, if, it, if, if, it's rub, if it rubs you the bad way, then it's, good, it's bad to you. So uh, how do you say a witch is good or bad? <laughs> I do not know. But if a versus, I mean, if a, I mean perception of um, the LA who are the witches in Yoruba cosmology is that of, they, they, it presents them as predators. They are predatory. They are predatory. Okay, so they were good. They, they sought a favor from Ifa to come to Earth because they were naked and he allowed them in. And they would never leave again. They stopped. They just like stayed there. They, they said they were not coming out because they found the place very, very cozy. It was, an, it was help. Get out already if you, I mean, he helped you get out of him, but he, they, they did not until he had to make divinations and did things to force them out of him. He felt in that space, I mean, presents them. And before they asked Romila to help them come to her, they've asked other people. They've asked the people who said, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm too scared of you. I am not giving you that help. So if they were good people or, or if Ifa presents them as good women or good birds, it would not have been that hard for them to get a ride from the unseen world to the physical world. So if I does not present them as really, really nice birds, that's all I will say. But I don't, I, the notion of weight of, um, of good or bad, I think is maybe too many Nollywood um, movies in Gazika. I think so. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I think Professor anybody wants to come. Yeah, I want to add to what you have said. Um, in Yoruba, philosophy and worldview. There is uh, one theory that is called theory of binary complementarities. Theory of binary complementarities. That is, 
you will not appreciate light without having darkness. So it is when you have light or when you have darkness that you appreciate the power of light and the space occupied by light. You know, let us take that one to the idea of the witches as well. As a person, I believe that there are good witches and there are bad witches. Like you said at the beginning of answering this question that it depends on the side of the coin. However, there are many Yoruba literatures that attest to the fact that there are good witches and there are bad witches. For example, during the Oshon uh, festival in Oshubu, one of the songs they usually sing during that period, young ladies who are witches, they are bold enough to come out openly that they are witches and they will be singing different kinds of songs. One of their songs is, Egbe olo wo legbe wa, Egbe olo ma la je osun, Ete lo sun ke le roma be do. That is our group is a group of prosperous people. Our own witches, they are the kind of witches that nurture, that bear children and nurture the children. If you really want to have good children, you want to have children that will protect, follow us, join our group. This is one of the songs they sing openly. People will be hearing, I recorded so much of these, I mean, these different kinds of these songs. So which means that they are both because they know that what they are doing is good. So therefore you cannot say that what they are doing is bad. Just like you said that when somebody is praying against enemies, the prayer to the person who is praying the prayer is good. But the recipient of the effect of the prayer that kind of prayer is bad. Therefore, I say it emphatically that there are good witches and there are bad witches. I'm not one anyway, but that is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. You are welcome. You are welcome. Um, okay, so we got maybe five more five minutes left. There are still actually quite a lot of questions. So unfortunately, I apologize to the audience, but I don't think we'll be able to go to all of them. And um, Dr. Bernard, uh, I know you can see the Q&A as well. I mean, you're welcome to pick one if you prefer. Um, I, I thought that the last one, perhaps, uh, about uh, the intersection between uh, the reference to the role of witches in Yoruba folklore mm -hmm. as holder of the seat of political power and preserves of the cosmos. How has these references evolved over the years and what significance does it have on the Yoruba and the environment from um, Ogunoye Oladimeji? Um, shall we take this one maybe as our last question so that we can also have a little bit of time for comments, uh, some final remarks? So I just, yeah, I'm really sorry because there are other questions I know. Um, there are some questions uh, surrounding the role of the forest, the grove, um, someone is asking um, about, um, you know, what, what sort of place is in terms of um, is the grove sort of uh, linked to being to sort of evil. Um, evil. Um, mm. And yeah, so that's also interesting. Uh, so yeah, so I leave this up. Uh, we can run out of time. So I leave these two questions for uh, Dr. Bernard, uh, and then she can make some final comment. And also Professor uh, Agibade want to make some final comments before, unfortunately, we have to close uh, this very interesting discussion. Well, thank you again, Angelica. So um, to answer, um, to start with Mr. Wuyi's um, question about this, which is a thing, yes. See, um, during the presentation, my presentation, I said something about the figure two, and which Professor Adibadi has mentioned just then about binary complementarity. So the Yorubas believe that there are checks and balances, okay? There is um, also the fact that if you have not experienced sickness, you would not appreciate health. If you have not been hungry, you will not appreciate it when you have food. If you have not been cold, if you have warm clothes, you will not appreciate it. So these things actually help to make you appreciate the little things of life. The same way in um, Yoruba folklore that, I mean, in the political system like you are asking about. Yes, till now, I think most, um, most um, in most cultures, they would say that um, man is the head, but women are the necks. And you know, it's the head just stays in the place, it is the neck that actually turns it. 
So in the that is how the I think um I mean which is working the political seats, okay? So they are not there in front, they are not the king, they are not the chiefs, but they are the ones who actually check the power, the, the use of power in these instances. They start serve uh, just like the Oboni, there are courts in Yoruba. We have the Oboni court, we have the court of Ike, and we have other courts as well. So these courts actually serve as checks and balances. So you can't you can't misuse power and you can't just um yes, one than one at one person had asked me before if the witches actually check and check people who is checking them well <laughs> mm, i don't know who's checking them but they actually do help have um to have a i mean the control of power to make sure that power is not heavily abused by anyone sitting in the, i mean strong political space so that is how i i mean it is they are presented in the um in the yoruba um philosophy so uh, okay, so how how have this um how has this reference involved over the years? Well, I would say that like um Professor Adwadi has said just then, um for example in Oshu in Oshu Oshubo, during Oshu Oshubo festival, the you you understand that Oshu is very very it, it is um placed because in the in the myth of the creation of Oshubo, Oshu is very very germane, Oshu is the main actor. And like he said that I just remember that I said, yes, there are people who actually claim to be witches. And Oshun even has been claimed to be a witch. And let me go back to the even the um myth of creation. So when the deities were descending, some some of the I mean many versions of um, myths that we have in Yoruba, I mean, I mean, I mean mythology, one of the very many myths that we have in the cosmology. We have um the story about and the myth about how. When they were descending, there were about 16 males who descended. Only Oshu was the female. And because she was the female, they didn't really regard really her. So they did a lot of things and they would not just involve her in the in, in planning processes or in decision making because she is a woman. She's a female deity. Until they could not, any, everything they did was not working. They could not do anything. Like whatever they did was not yielding the results that they were expecting. They had to go back to Rudmari who told them that they had to go and invite and seek counsel with Oshu, who was the only female in that company. So that tells you how much power women wield in the political structure of um, Yoruba. So I think that how that is still now, I still think it's, it's still the same because in Oshu, in Oshu, like I said, when there is Oshu and there's um, during Oshu festival, the uh, the um, the um, sorry, the Atauja, who is the king of um, Oshogu, who is the king of Oshogu, has he has a very, I mean he plays a very I mean a very primary role during Oshu Oshogu because of the place of um, Oshu in the myth of creation of that particular town. So politically, women and or uh, witches hold a very strong seat in Yoruba um, philosophy. I hope that has um, yeah. And maybe now they do it more um, um, a little bit. They, they don't come out as they don't say witches. And you need progress. So everybody said I'm not a witch. Just then they had to like quickly like say. But I think um, most if you have some feminists, they will say whoever you call and answers you is a witch. And it's about to Jenny. Whoever you have, you call and ask that if the person responds to you, that person is a witch. So that tells you that there are still witches in them. Um, the culture who actually answer you when you call them. Yeah, but I think that that is all I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're sort of running out a bit of time. I would like to bring back Professor Gibade for a few a final comments, if that's okay. And yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Yeah, you are, you are welcome. Yeah, as she has said, um, let me just say finally that in Yoruba, cosmology and political structure. As we have male factor, we also have female factors. And these factors are just for checks and balances. Because without female factor, male factor cannot stand, honestly speaking. And I want to say, I'm a man. However, I want to say it categorically that Many people have not really studied the power of women in cosmology. Women, to me as a person, women are more powerful 
than men. Even though Yoruba will say that this is a patriarchal society, patriarchal for noting, not patriarchal for essence. Women are more powerful than men in Yoruba cosmology. And there are many proofs. In fact, there are many scientific and spiritual proofs to say that women are more powerful than women. So when we are talking about powers of witches, honestly speaking, it is very real and working in every sphere of life. Thank you very much for the opportunity given to me to be a discussant. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kibade. Thank you so much, uh, yeah. Dr. Bernard. Uh, it was a fantastic presentation. Final, I'm sorry, final. So much discussion. Okay. Yes, yes, of course, of just, course. Just one word. Yeah, okay. no, no, more, more than one, more than one. You, Thank I think you, you so want to, you left the final words now. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't want you to round up before I say anything. Allow me just a few words. Uh, again, I want to thank Professor Akibadi for coming. I want to really appreciate his input and his comment. And I want to thank my mom. She came in. I saw her like, yay, mom, yeah, she was there for, yeah. And then she ran away. I think she has to go to church. In church. So, and then my sister, I saw her too. My, my sister, she's my mom's firstborn. I saw her. She was there. Thank you very much. And I had, okay, so when I was in primary school, I, I was the, the head girl. So I had a, uh, um, the head boy who yeah, went to the same primary school, went to the same secondary school, and then he's at Yale and he came. So yeah, my head boy is right there. Like he came, I saw him. And I want to thank really everyone, Ngosika, the titles, everybody. I know, um, I can't mention, I see people, I see names. I know people that I know, I see a lot of names and I want to tell you how grateful I am for the support. I see my friends from secondary school, a lot of them who have actually said they will come and they did. Most of them are very busy, they still come. And I see my colleagues from work as well at Obafemi Law University and my, my, my fellows from University of Michigan, they came. And yeah, they, they did, I, I, the support is overwhelming. Thank you so much guys and thank you Angelica. You know, I never say it enough. Um, I, I, yeah, you, you are a gem. And everyone, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to everyone. And if I've forgotten to mention anything, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and finally, I'm sorry. I have to say that I want to thank Professor Nini Wariboko because yeah, I had to do a more presentation and I was I was sweating bricks. <laughs> yeah, so that prepared me for this. And I want to say thank you very much. He, he came and then I think he had to come. So thank you, everyone. Everyone, Dr. Badegashi, thank you. I see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. It was uh, really, really inspiring. And I'm so pleased to hear exactly that so many people uh, close to you came. And, uh, you know, I know some of them. I saw some Leventi, past Leventis actually as well in there, and which is really nice to, uh, to, to, to stay connected through the Leventis, um, the Leventis program. And thank you so much, everyone. We have to close, unfortunately, but there will be more Leventis uh, seminar. Let's stay in touch. Uh, connect with us at SOAS and, um, and let's keep talking about this very interesting research. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to everybody involved, the Leventis, and thank you, Mari, uh, for, for being in the audience. Thank, thank you. you and yeah. goodbye for now. Bye. Bye bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.